All right. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our History Happy Hour tonight. It's great to see so many of you, so many of you virtually here with your beverages, if I can uh, see those. My name is Bethany Rockbeck. I'm the Director of Education and Engagement here at the Indiana Historical Society. And I am going to be uh, kind of our moderator for tonight for our History Happy Hour, We Must Be Fearless, Votes for Women in Indiana with Dr. Anita Morgan. This happy hour is brought to you with support from One America Financial Partners, a national provider in the insurance and financial services marketplace. My role tonight is going to be kind of moderating our chat box. I'll be uh, placing some links in that chat box for us of interesting things that Anita and Callie are going to be talking about. But before I hand over our session to Callie tonight, I'm gonna to go over a little bit of our Zoom logistics. As you are entering this event and participating tonight, I'm going to be muting each of you. Not because I don't want to hear your voices, I just want to hear what Anita and Callie have to say too. You'll know you're muted because the little red microphone is going to be on the corner of your screen. You can unmute yourself by either clicking on the microphone button in the bottom left hand corner if you're on your if you are on your computer or tapping on it on the top toolbar if you're on your iPad. You can also toggle between what your screen looks like by clicking on the view options in the top right corner of the computer. We suggest uh, watching this in presenter style, which will keep either Callie or um, Callie or Anita up kind of at the top of your screen in the main part. But you can also toggle to your gallery view to see each of us in a little bit of a Brady Bunch style. For this event tonight, Callie and Anita will talk for about 30 minutes, and then we're going to open it up to your questions. If you have a question throughout the program, please drop that in the chat box as we go along. I'm gonna be keeping tabs on that and getting them to Callie and, Callie and Anita throughout this evening. We'll pepper them in and uh, try to get to as many as we can during our question and answer portion of this evening. Also, as I mentioned, keep an eye on that chat box. We'll drop some links and URLs into that box as we go. You can right click on them and then paste it into whatever web browser you would like. All of those links will also be delivered to your inbox tomorrow morning in our, in our uh, thank you email. If you enjoy this program tonight, I really hope that you considered coming back for more. We'll be continuing our History Happy Hour series next Thursday with Distilling History of Indiana's Black Forest with distiller and historian Alan Bishop of Spirits of French Lick. You can sign up for that and other events at indianahistory.org where you will see not only our happy hours, but also some of our other virtual offerings. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Callie and Anita. Hi everybody, it's so great to virtually see you all today. I miss seeing everyone in person, but it's nice to be able to get to know some people that are a little farther out from our normal reach in Indianapolis. My name's Callie, I work at the Indiana Historical Society, um, and I have had the pleasure of working on our suffrage commemoration for about two years um, and geek out all about the ladies that fought for our right to vote, or as I say, fought to our right to party. Um, and so it's my pleasure to introduce today Anita Morgan, uh, who uh, received all of her degrees from a BS, an MS, an MA, and a PhD from Purdue University. So she spent quite a bit of time uh, up in Lafayette. She's now the senior lecturer at IUPUI and the former director of undergraduate studies for the history department former director of individualized majors program for the School of Liberal Arts, and in 2011 was named outstanding lecturer for the School of Liberal Arts. If you've ever had a class with Anita, you know it's great, and I have lots of testimony to that fact too. Uh, she's the past president of the Indiana Association of Historians and one of the organizers of the Hoosier Women at Work Conference, which I'm happy to say we got in just before the pandemic shut everything down. So I hope some of you were able to come along with us for that one. It was a great day. Uh, Anita's published many articles in the Indiana Magazine of History, Traces, the New York History Magazine, the Michigan Historical Review, and Ohio Valley History. And she's the author of this amazing book. 
We Must Be Fearless, the women's suffrage movement in Indiana, which you can buy from our Basile History Market at the Historical Society. And we'll get more info about that to you in the chat box uh, sometime soon. Plus, it'll be in your email tomorrow morning. There we go. Thanks. Thanks, Bethany. So with that, hi, Anita. How are you doing tonight? I am great. How are you? I'm great. I'm Thanks really for having me. Yeah, no problem. I'm really excited to talk to you about this book. I've been telling Anita, I've been sneaking uh, peeks of the book while it was in manuscript form because um, our editor, Ray, who is on this call, um, likes me enough to sneak it to me. And I was only getting to read it in bits and pieces when I had time. And it was like a reward for doing a good day. Uh, so I'm really excited the whole world gets to read it too. <laughs> So we're gathered today in this virtual happy hour. Um, what are you drinking tonight, Anita? Uh, I am copying some of the suffragists and I am having ice water. Ah, so I was gonna ask, what do you think the suffragists would have drank? <laughs> what would uh, their choice? <laughs> uh, ice water, uh, <laughs> lemonade. Uh, it kind of depends on whether or not they're a suffragist first or a prohibitionist first. Mm -hmm. uh, or if you're like um, Susan B. Anthony, um, you believe in prohibition, but you don't want that to get in the way of people being in favor of suffrage. So you don't talk about your feelings about prohibition as much and you emphasize suffrage. Um, That's a smart lady. <laughs> she was. And there were a lot of women in Indiana uh, who felt the same way. They felt that talking about personal issues like whether or not you drink would get in the way of people deciding whether or not to support suffrage. Uh, I sent you a couple of slides that might uh -huh. be good for yeah. right now. Cool. There we go. <laughs> uh, these are, I wanted to show these for a couple of reasons. Uh, these are from 1915. Um, and they're both depicting the same thing. Uh, and it does have to do with suffragists and drinking, but it'll take me a minute to get there. Um, the General Federation of Women's Clubs in 1915 was trying to elect a new president. And uh, the, one of the women who was running, Lenore Cox, um, yeah, go, there we go. There we go, sorry. Was, um, uh, was accused of um, serving hard liquor to the guests at her house and playing golf on Sunday. Uh, uh, and various other uh, crimes, shall we say, uh, and was considered to be uh, not good enough uh, to be the president of the General Federation of Clubs, even though she was a suffragist. And the saying was, well, drinking might be okay for a suffragist, but not for someone who's going to be the president of the clubs. Uh, and this, both of these cartoons show the, the back and forth uh, that the women had and the really strong feelings they had about prohibition and whether or not uh, women should drink. Uh, they also, quite frankly, uh, show how much male cartoonists and male uh, newspaper editors like to make a big deal out of any time they found out that women were fighting or um, arguing or having a disagreement. They made sure that, that there'll be another blow up in 1916 and they make sure that unfortunately, well, fortunately, I guess this time there are no cartoons, uh, but they do talk about it um, in, in the problems that they had. In the end, what's really funny about this particular election is that the woman who won the election was the favorite of the prohibitionists and they were so glad that she didn't drink. Uh, but after the election, she did admit that she liked to have a beer every now and then. <laughs> I was gonna say one of the moments in your book that is the most frustrating for me is when they all break out into argument and everything stops. And I just, I had moments where I was like, I have to walk away because I just want to wring the necks of these like 1919 ladies who are frankly all long dead by now. So I don't know about other historians on this, but I feel like we all have these moments where we're really frustrated by our uh, historical figures. Well, and I think we, I think we expect too much of them. I think we expect them to say, okay, the vote is what we want and that's our goal and to focus on that and to forget that they're, you know, men argue when they're arguing about how to achieve a goal. Uh, they get upset with each other. So, but we expect women, I guess, to just be calm and quiet and not have arguments. 
I feel like decorum is such a big part of all of this. I will say someone that um, I made a special theme drink. Uh, let me. Oh, yes. Yeah. Um, I'm just going to do that so y'all can see me a little bit. I made a special theme drink and it was inspired by one of my favorite suffragists from Indiana, Mary Frame Thomas, who um, was one of those people that I see someone else really loves Mary Frame Thomas. She's an unsung hero of Indiana suffrage and really brought people together uh, and for suffrage and continually did that. Um, Mary Thomas was a doctor and so I made a shrub uh, blueberry shrub, which is a vinegar, sugar, and fruit mixture, because shrubs were something that you'd medicinally give to people on a really hot day to keep them cool or to prevent nausea. Um, and then I use seltzer water, so there's not actually alcohol in here because Mary Thomas was a prohibitionist and didn't drink. Um, but I thought I'd cheers to her. Um, but can I tell you my favorite part about Mary Frame Thomas? And it's not exactly exactly about suffrage, but she was one of the first female doctors in all of Indiana and the country. And in 1830s, when you wanted to be a doctor as a woman, you had to go to Philadelphia because they were the ones, only ones that would teach you. IU was like, we're not teaching you. Um, though I think it wasn't IU yet at that point. So Mary sews enough clothes for her family that they can last for three months. And she, she talks about this. She sewed enough clothes, they had enough clothes for three months, and she leaves them and misses the first suffrage meeting of the whole state and sends Amanda away a letter, right? Um, right, absolutely, absolutely, yeah. <laughs> sends yeah, Amanda away a letter, comes back three months later, and she reports that her family was just fine. So I'm really glad that she trained her family well. <laughs> that. That's my little plug to Mary Frank <laughs> Thomas. I like her because she stuck with the movement for 30 years. Yeah, that was impressive. People sometimes come and go out of clubs uh, and she stuck with it for 30 years. And I would say her name just keeps coming up time and time again. Uh, like you see her at the beginning, then you see her again in the 1870s. And unfortunately, she doesn't live long enough to see suffrage. But I feel like she's one of those stalwart people that other suffrag suffragists from Indiana kind of you hear about them more. But Mary Thomas, unsung hero. Got to get her a historical marker soon. I'm hoping. Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess that kind of starts me with, um, let's start with early suffrage in Indiana. Um, it took women a while to get the right to vote, right? Yes, yes it did. Uh, 69 years, uh, women in Indiana uh, pushed for the vote. Uh, they started in 1851. Um, and as you mentioned, Amanda Way and Dr. Mary Thomas, Dr. Mary Thomas from afar by writing letters, um, offering support, but Amanda Way uh, managed to get women together um, and formed the Indiana Women's Rights Association. Uh, they were motiv motivated a lot uh, by the fact that Indiana had just written a new constitution and had failed to include a married woman's property law in the constitution. There was one on the books, but since it wasn't in the Constitution, women feared that it could be overturned and changed at any time. And they wanted something more concrete. And though they tried really hard and they gave Robert Dale Owen a silver tea service just for trying, which always, uh, he that's tried. What so I he gets, want when I try. That's, I would <laughs> like one when I try. Okay, uh, keep that so, in mind for the future gifts for you. <laughs> <okay>. <laughs> Uh, but they, they had, so they were worried about married women's property law. They were worried about uh, people drinking too much. They were abolitionists. They were, Indiana suffragists were that perfect storm of the prominent reform organizations of the day. Uh, and they thought the best way to achieve everything, of course, was by having the vote. Um, do you think that that was, like, do you think getting the vote would have solved all their problems? Or was it just like one step in that whole... <laughs> Well, I think they oh, they really value the vote since they didn't have it. And I think they'll realize once they have it that just having the vote doesn't solve all your problems because women don't vote as a block. Women yeah. have, have varying opinions. Uh, and so it just, um, it didn't quite work out the way they wanted. Let's put it that way. So what was the argument for not allowing women to vote? I, maybe I'm short on the concept, but it's hard for me to imagine. <laughs> What uh, did the men say? 
first, I do want to give credit um, to, the, to the men who did support suffrage, and there were a lot of them, and there were a lot of um, Protestant ministers who really wanted women to be able to vote. They show up as early as 1869. Uh, and the reason they wanted women to vote was the same reason a lot of people didn't want women to vote. Because the ministers thought, well, if women can vote, then they'll uh, vote in favor of child labor laws mm. or women's labor laws or to restrict or outlaw drinking uh, <laughs> or maybe some, some laws to rein in vice. And so there was the idea on the part of people who were maybe brewers maybe ran factories who had child labor or uh, poor working conditions for women. They were afraid that if women got the vote, they might, they might change those. So there was, um, I know it's amazing, industrialists were so concerned about women's, I guess, perceived moral superiority uh, mm -hmm. that they thought that would happen, which is another reason why some men didn't want women to vote. They thought, well, if they go, if they get into politics, which is a, dirty, dirty business, they thought, then women will be less pure and less moral and it will corrupt women and it will be so bad for them. Uh, and so they thought women should just stay away from that and um, influence from afar, yeah. uh, if you will. And then there were the ones who thought, well, if women can vote, they won't have children. Oh, yeah, that one really keeps another from happening. I see that logic. <laughs> Uh, well, it was it was a concern. They thought, well, if they get involved in politics, they won't want to have any more children, and and then what are we going to do? I'm I mean, at least they were looking out for that. Um, I think it's always hard to understand the arguments from the past when you don't necessarily see that today. Um, right. And that's as a historian, it's something I've always had those moments with. But um, I'm glad that we won the right to vote because I really enjoy exercising my civic duty um absolutely at least twice a year um so um when i've been reading and researching about suffrage there are so many different organizations um it's sort of like alphabet soup and they all change names so how how were why were there so many different clubs do you think and um how did that help to mobilize suffrage uh, it's very confusing uh, when you start to read newspapers or even manuscript collections. Uh, it looks like there are just more suffrage organizations than seems possible for the population of the state at the time. How could they support so many? And part of that is that sometimes the newspapers don't report the names correctly. And you have to do a lot of reading to realize that they're actually talking about an organization with a slightly different name, but the reporter hasn't bothered to get the name correct, which is really irritating uh, when you see that. Uh, it's just a women's group and they weren't worried about the names. Uh, the other thing you have to remember though is transportation being what it was before the 20th century, before the automobile, you will see a lot of organizations that are not necessarily linked together in cities um, yeah. all around the state and even within the state. Um, because they just can't get out or sometimes uh, in Indianapolis there are a lot of little clubs that are neighborhood clubs. Oh okay. So like College Corner will have one, Irvington will have one, uh, it just you know they I mean you can hop a you can hop a, a trolley sure but it's just easier to have your suffrage meeting if you only have to walk three blocks over and and meet with your friends. So part of it is, is a misunderstanding of club names, but part of it is uh, people tend to want to bond with their neighbors, if you will. I get that. Indianapolis is such, especially, is such a neighborhood-based city, and we call it the neighborhood, the city of homes. So I get that kind of makes a lot of logical sense to me in thinking about how we function as a city. Um, but it kind of brings me into my question about, my next question about tactics. So... I've read, oh, I know I've, and I've read in your book that women knew how to organize because they organized around these social clubs. But what kind of tactics did women use for suffrage and to get it passed? Uh, are you talking about like um, legislative or public or both? Um, both? Yeah, I'm, well, let's go to both. Yeah, <laughs> let's go to both. Well, when they started out in the 19th century, they, they really relied on petitioning and petitioning and petitioning the legislature and 
and giving speeches. Um, and they, they realized eventually that that was not really getting them anywhere because they could talk all they wanted to, um, but they can't vote. So how are they gonna persuade legislators to do what they want if they're not voters? So what you'll see beginning in about 1910 is a shift to let's, let's persuade the whole public. Let's get everyone behind us. And I think I sent you a couple of slides of some things that they did uh, once, once, once cars are in. Get yeah, you there all, go. there we go. Okay. So there, yeah, there's some, there's some cars. <laughs> yeah, um, this was a street meeting at Illinois and Market Street, as it says here in downtown Indianapolis. And cars were wonderful because you could park your car at the side of the road and because the tops, of course, could come down, you could stand in your car and you were elevated above the crowd. Uh, and then you could give these uh, suffrage talks. And these kinds of street meetings uh, happened on a regular basis uh, in Indianapolis once they realized that, as you can see here, this is a great way to draw a crowd. Well, and didn't they also then take their cars and like was able to connect the state with them too, right? Road rallies and... Oh yeah, absolutely. Uh, women adopt, I don't know how they did that. I really don't because uh, the, the tops were down, they were riding around on, on these dusty country roads and they went, they went everywhere. Uh, the first rally was to uh, Westfield. Oh. Uh, and that same day they went to Noblesville and then the next week they went to Zinesville in Lebanon. So they started out of Indianapolis and, and they got great publicity because the newspapers covered them extensively. Uh, and then around the state, other women said, hey, this is a great idea. I would say, I think um, there's also a story of a woman that went on a, two women that went on a national road trip with their cat um, to promote suffrage, which is one of my favorite. There's some great pictures of them in this open face car with the cat. Um, I think there's a couple blog posts from the Smithsonian about it, but um, I really wish that our ladies had traveled with their cats because that would have made my life. <laughs> I mean, why and not I think <laughs> you have another slide here too. I think it's yeah. the next one. Oh, there we go. Yeah. Tom yeah. Oh. This is this is one of my favorite. Uh, this is actually cropped from a much larger picture that was on the front page uh, of the newspaper. And I cropped out the Republican candidate for president, uh, Charles <laughs> Evans Hughes. I, I decided he wasn't, he's not the focus I wanted. Uh, but this was at a 1916 Republican rally, and it was at the end of a a suffrage parade that was led by uh, the vice presidential candidate, which was the former vice president, uh, Fairbanks, who was from Indianapolis, who was a strong suffrage supporter. Uh, and they paraded around and then they uh, took their place in the balcony. And I love the banner that they made. That's the, that's the wording of the 19th Amendment, uh, just to get their point across, you know, subtly uh, to the crowd. Sometimes you've got to hit him across the face. You can't be subtle about it, right? You really, you really can't. Um, the, the one thing I wish that had actually happened that didn't uh, was the baseball game. Mm. They wanted to have a suffrage baseball game, and it wasn't clear who the players would be. I don't know if it, men would play or if the women would play, uh, but they couldn't get the field at a low enough price. Oh that they could do that. But I thought that was a really innovative idea. I will say they do some other, we're gonna talk about, I think, well, let's talk about it. My favorite thing that they do is the tease with the um, pageants. Uh, yes. And I will say that I, I will, one of the things about suffrage that is frustrating about here in Indiana is that there are two times when suffrage almost happens and then it's like the men i mean frankly it's the men the people and the guys in charge change their mind and pull it out of our hands Absolutely. um and one of those times is 1917 and they put together this pageant i'll let you talk about it it's but it's so great <laughs> <laughs> it's it's so much fun uh 1917 was was one of those years where the suffragists had their highest highs and their lowest lows uh three laws were passed in the legislative session uh, earlier that year in February, one was for partial suffrage, one was for a constitutional amendment uh, to the Indiana Constitution granting full suffrage 
and then there was a bill for constitutional convention to 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 change the constitution um and um the partial suffrage bill uh, was tied up in the courts because immediately men challenged these and said, oh no, we don't want you to do this. Uh, they were challenged in the courts uh, all the way through uh, October and all the way through the beginning of suffrage season, which always began in the fall. They didn't meet in the summers, they always began in the fall. And while they were waiting to find out if they were going to be able to vote uh, with partial suffrage, um, they put on this wonderful play um, uh, Eugenie Nicholson was one of the authors, I believe. Uh, Mrs. Ken Hubbard was another one. Uh, we haven't found the script yet, but it would be great to see it. Uh, but they gave, um, do you mind if I just read the passage from the book? It's like a short paragraph. Oh, yeah, go for it. I, I was going to say, I always, I had to go hunt it down in the newspaper because I was all about it. Because uh, they have great names uh, also. They do. <laughs> they do. Uh, and by the way, this idea of putting on plays to get the point across how you felt about suffrage, it wasn't just Indiana that did that. Uh, there were other suffrage plays uh, that were produced, but I don't think one was even as fun uh, as this one. Uh, it's okay. Uh, every, every year, local suffrage groups held a tea to kick off the fall and winter events. In 1917, a group of suffragists pre presented a unique play, which they termed a melodrama. In the play, November 6th, which is election day, is the day that Lindiana, which is a clever nod to Indiana, and Bill Suffrage, that's this see here, <laughs> uh, are to marry. Lindy's aunt, Auntie Suff, tells Lindy that California, California, <laughs> uh, Carizona, Arizona, uh, and other girls who have married into the suffrage family regret their marriages and fear that Lindy will as well. As at Auntie Suff's insistence, Lindy's father, P. Pull, forbids the nuptials. The villain in the play, who you see here, uh, Sir Dark, who happens to be a knight, which is the name of the man who was fighting against women's suffrage. Uh, Sir, Sir Dark has strong feelings against the marriage, although he never really states why. He dresses as a clergyman and just happens to run into Bill Suffrage, who is looking for someone to quickly marry he and Lindy. Sir Dark, still dressed as a minister, persuades physicians to test Bill's constitution. Bill endures a physical exam that includes pounding him and reciting passages from the state constitution. Poor Bill yells that Millie Noyes did it. Why not Lindiana? Uh, during this turmoil, People has a change of heart, enters with a real pastor, and exposes Sir Dark as a fraud. Lindy Anna and Bill Suffrage wed, and Sir Dark admits that all along he had only been worried about the taxes. Well, it's and a great play. It's a great play with great like um, names, but then they change it too, if I remember yes. correctly. When yes, uh, they have when 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 suffrage loses in the courts, uh, there is another suffrage meeting. I believe it was in Terre Haute. Uh, where they changed the ending of the play. And uh, in the end, uh, four physicians who are testing Bill's constitution, um, three of those four poison him. <laughs> and they kill Bill. I mean, it, they, <laughs> how could you plan a better alternate ending, I guess, than that? <laughs> I guess. Uh, it's so creative and it's, it gets the point across. Uh, yeah, yeah it, it, it really does. And, and it was evidently pretty popular around the state because you'll see little snippets of it being mentioned in newspapers. It, uh, makes so, me, it makes me feel like if I was fighting for a bill to become a law, I might put together a play to get my ideas. I, <laughs> it makes me feel like I would have been friends with these ladies. I hope I would have been if I was around at that time. <laughs> well, it also shows how clever they are. Uh, the Indianapolis News carries a lot of the suffrage news, so they have they've been really smart, uh, and they made friends with the Indianapolis News reporters uh, to get their message out there, which was also a really good idea. Well, and also had some key suffragists were reporters, right? Uh, yes, they were, uh, and the names I'm sorry oh, have just <laughs> gone gone out of my head i know i saw lindsay on here i know she names knows the there's name a of couple them. there's a couple of them that have names that they use in the papers i know because when i was trying to research right. them, 
I had, to, it took me a while to realize that wasn't their real name. It was their pen names. Um, right. but it actually kind of leads, it reminds me of uh, Francis Barry Coston, who right. kind of leads us into our next question, okay. which um, when we think of suffragists, especially, yeah, Esther, thank you, Sue. Esther Griffin White is definitely one of those uh, ladies that wrote a lot. Um, and I think I see Ed, Ida Houston, Houston Harper, also a prolific writer. Uh, if right, we but have there was one from Indianapolis, then the Indiana Historical Bureau did oh, an article um, on her. Uh, Grace Julian Clark. Well, she, she, had new, she had articles in the newspaper, yeah, she had yeah. a column every week. Um, but when we think of suffragists, we think of white middle-class ladies wearing sashes. Um, I think of American Girl dolls, that sort of, that sort of piece. From your research, were, was that what Indiana suffragists look like? Um, and if not, how is it different? Uh, it is and it isn't, as you might expect. Uh, the slide that you have up here, uh, you can see that there is a handbill to the women of the labor unions. Um, the suffragists uh, reached out to um, women who worked in factories. Um, they Many of those women uh, formed suffrage clubs. Uh, the Equal Suffrage Association um, was very good at one of the, that's one of the two major suffrage groups right before suffrage, was very good at reaching out to unions uh, and getting uh, women and men, definitely and the men as well, uh, involved uh, with suffrage. They got the um, approval of the United Mine Workers. So they're definitely reaching out to the working classes, to people uh, who uh, must work. Uh, there's also uh, several African-American suffrage clubs in, around Indiana, including several in Indianapolis. Um, yeah, and there we see- I just wanna um, make sure you show their pictures. <laughs> yes, thank you. Uh, that's a great idea. Uh, that's also, there's uh, Carrie Barnes Ross, uh, which was, very fun to find uh, a photo of her. Um, one of the problems with looking at the African-American suffrage clubs is it can be really hard to find um, photos and documentation. Uh, but Carrie uh, Ross's granddaughter actually sent that picture to me, uh, which was very nice of her to do. Uh, and then Bertha Coakley, uh, who Marcia sent that to me, uh, who was part of an integrated suffrage club uh, in Terre Haute at what became Indiana State University. Um, so suffragists were of all classes. Uh, they were of all races. Um, uh, they worked together. Uh, we know, for example, that uh, in Muncie and in Indianapolis, uh, there was visiting back and forth between the African American clubs and the, the white women's suffrage clubs. Uh, and a lot of times these were women who already knew each other from, from other um, club activities for women's clubs. So for example, uh, forming tuberculosis camps. And there was a, a club, an African-American women's club in Indianapolis who worked to get a tent set up at the summer camp, the tuberculosis camp, and they knew the white women who were involved and teachers. Teachers are so important to the suffrage movement at this time period. Uh, they all know each other, uh, and it happens here uh, and uh, also in Kentucky where they don't work together, but African-American teachers are very much involved in the suffrage movement as well. Uh, so I was, it's, and the same thing happens in Dayton, Ohio. Uh, there have been a lot of suffrage books come out lately, and working class women and African-American women show up a lot more uh, in the newest books that have come out. Uh, I think in part because with so many records that have been digitized, we now have better access to finding uh, where they are. I could, if the newspapers were not digitized, a lot of what goes on with African-American suffrage, I don't think I would have found. Yeah, I will say it's, I, from before they were digitized, the a complete run of Indianapolis newspapers till after, I was in grad school when that happened, changed the game on how I wrote a thesis. So I can imagine how difficult it would be. Thank God for the librarians at the State Library who were 
indexing things, but it's easy to miss and easy to miss chunks of years within that. Oh, it's absolutely, this, the book that I wrote could not have been written, say five years ago, definitely not 10 years ago, uh, just because it would have taken so long to search through all of the newspapers from around the state. And now with Hoosier State Chronicles and newspapers.com, you just type in your search words and pop, there it is. And it just makes it so much better. And shout out to those resources. I'm sure we'll get those into the chats if you don't know about them. Um, but Hoosier State Chronicles is great because it's free. Um, it's connected to Chronicling America, which is a national program through the Library of Congress. But our state library has been digitizing newspapers now for years. And they also have a great blog. So if you haven't checked that out, it's pretty cool. Um, I want to make sure I talk about the elephant in the room before we kind of start to getting to open it up for questions. And this is something that I and a lot of my colleagues who have been working in suffrage commemorations have been talking about and trying to answer is the question of, did all women in Indiana specifically get the right to vote in 1920? We hear a yeah. lot of stories and a lot of conversations about our states around the country. And though we got the right to vote, African-American, Asian, Native American women couldn't actually vote. So what research have you found about Indiana and what don't we know? <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> part of it, right? <laughs> uh, well, part of the problem is uh, that's the kind of research that has to be done at the local level. Mm -hmm. uh, the state archives has a, a limited amount. They were gracious enough uh, to search for voting records uh, when I asked and uh, very, very precious few do they have for 1920 or 1924, uh, which is unfortunate. Uh, so we have to rely on newspapers uh, for that. Uh, and hopefully somebody will go to local courthouses and look for more things. Uh, I, I looked this up because I thought you might tell, you might ask me about this. So I have an answer. Um, I, say, I know Leonamius isn't on this program, but Leonamius and I have been asking this question and trying to answer this question for two years, so <laughs> go well, into the first, expert. <laughs> let, me, let me tell you first what happened at the national level so you can see the difference. Uh, in 1920, not all women voted in that November election. Um, the, the 19th Amendment was not ratified until August 26th, and by that time, many states had closed their registration for the November election. States like Indiana opened up their registration so that women could register so that they could vote. Uh, but for example, four states, Arkansas, Georgia, Mississippi, and South Carolina refused to open their registration. So not only did African-American women not vote, white women did not vote either uh, in that election. And so it just really depended state to state to state if they opened their registration, whether any woman uh, could vote or not. Um, we do know also nationally that in states where it was easy to register and where the races were competitive, there was a heavy turnout of women in the 1920 elections. And this is brand new research that's just uh, come out this year. Um, we have a little problem with saying just how many because there were no modern polling methods, records have not been kept, uh, women were not voting in separate ballot boxes as had been suggested at one time. And I'm almost kind of sad they weren't, so we could really tell uh, what happened. But that's, that's what's going on nationally. Now in Indiana, okay. <laughs> um, Indiana in 1920 has a 73.4% turnout for the election. Wow, I wish we had that today. That would be amazing. I know, I know. Uh, it was great. Uh, and Harding won easily uh, that year. Uh, in Marion County, the Indianapolis News reported that less than 5,000 of the approximately 76,000 women who registered to vote did not vote. So that is a huge female turnout to vote, which is pretty amazing. Uh, and most of them voted in the morning. And that happened throughout the state. Women got up uh, and they vote. One woman said she was afraid that with so many extra voters that if she didn't vote early, they might run out of ballots in places <laughs> where they weren't voting machines. 
And so uh, women were waiting there for the doors to open um, to vote, which was pretty neat. Um, we also know in Indianapolis, in the fifth and sixth wards, which are the populated predominantly by African Americans in Indianapolis at that point, uh, the newspaper reported heavy registrations and heavy uh, voter turnout of both men and women. And of course, I sent you that nice picture we have of the polling place uh, on Indiana Avenue uh, of African American women voting in the 1920 election. Indeed, you did. Hold on. <laughs> there we go. And oh, right. there, there they go. are. Uh, and that is in approximately the location where the Noodles and Company is right now uh, on oh. Indiana Avenue, if you're wondering exactly uh, where that is. Now I want to um, take it and hold it up in that exact. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, so there was so African American women and, and white women in Indiana did vote, and they voted in large numbers in 1920. And according to the newspapers, um, they also served as poll workers, hmm. as clerks, or as the person who checked your name in in the poll book. Uh, and then in 1924, uh, we hear the same thing okay. uh, that there was, in fact, more women voted. Uh, in 1924 than voted in 1920. And again, uh, women from all walks of life uh, voted as well. Uh, and, that, and you have to give them credit, right? Because the 1920s is the era of the Klan uh, in Indiana and they voted. Well, and that's, I think, part of our question was if African-American women did get to vote in 1920, be, by the time you get to 1924, Christmas Attic School is being built. We've resegregated our schools. The Klan is at its height or kind of coming down. And so I didn't know if that would, that was part of always my question of did one keep it from the other? And I know that sometimes um, records existing, we just don't know. Uh, the, if, we, if we go by the newspapers, what's really interesting is in 1924, which was kind of the Klan election, if you will, 42% uh, of African Americans voted in the first five hours that day. Hmm. Uh, just got up and went out and um, uh, voted. And they switched their allegiance in that election uh, from voting a straight Republican ticket, which they had since the Civil War. Mm -hmm. uh, and they were reporting that in Indianapolis, they would vote for Coolidge, who was the Republican for president, Mm -hmm. but they voted straight Democratic for the state tickets because the Democratic Party was less Klan affiliated than the Republican Party. So they were splitting their tickets. Um, Richmond, Indiana reports, for example, that they had 800 African-American voters, men and women in town, and the majority voted Democratic that, that year. So the difference the Klan made was not necessarily in turnout, but in which party you voted for. Yeah. Interesting. Well, I want to make sure to put a shout out that if you do have questions for Anita, throw them into the chat um, and we'll make sure we pepper them in. Um, but as we're, as you guys are starting to write your questions, I have one more for her. Well, I have lots more, but we'll go with one more. Um, <laughs> it's the hundredth anniversary of women voting. We're doing suffrage all year round. Um, what would you, how would you suggest if people want to celebrate suffrage, how, what would be the best way for them to go do that? Um, well, you're going to have a celebration down on the canal, I understand, in <laughs> August. <laughs> I am. So on August 29th, we're holding a block, hopefully, having a block, you know, everything's, but we're holding a block party outside. We, the State Museum, the Idle Jordan Museum, and the State House will be free that day. We're going to do a big kickoff at 10 o'clock and then a party along the canal. Uh, so come for fun. Um, I'm, uh, come down to Indianapolis and hang out with us that day from an appropriately social distanced space. Um, but I will, uh, I know there are some, there are some local places, uh, in, in different counties who are having some things, Monroe County, uh, Miami County up at Peru, which is where, uh, Marie Edwards, the last president of the Women's Franchise League was from. They've been doing, I, I think there's going to be a lot and I hope there'll be a lot of county celebrations. My guess is Terre Haute will have something since they have a heavy number of suffragists from Terre Haute as well. Um, and what I really hope happens this year is that um, the counties really dig into their suffrage material. 
because a lot of my work is the bigger cities in Indianapolis, Fort Wayne, Indianapolis, Terre Haute, but there were a lot of things. I mean, who knew so much was going on in Peru? Uh, <laughs> a lot went on in Peru. Uh, a lot went on in Muncie. Uh, uh, a lot went on in some of the smaller towns as, as well, but we just, we just don't know. And I will say uh, shout, I, shout out to Jessica Jenkins at Minatristo, who's got a yes. lot of Muncie stuff coming out. So if you're interested in Muncie history, she's the gal to look for. Absolutely. Um, and yeah, Bethany just threw it in the chat, but um, if you want to know about activities going on around the state, get some info on how you can help commemorate in your location, going to indianasuffrage100.org, which is a group that um, has put together this website and um, is part of the state commission that is celebrating women's suffrage. Um, They're a wonderful group and they've done a lot of really interesting things this year. I just hope that we get to attend a lot of them. Yeah, I will say we, Indiana ratified the amendment in January, on January 16th. And so there was a lot that happened in January. And so we're hoping we still get to keep on going. Um, oh, and also, if you want to celebrate suffrage, pick up and read the book, guys. <laughs> I know I've got a lot of questions in the chat. So let me start with... Um, Monica wanted, I, this is something I haven't thought of. Did, did you come across anything where the flu pandemic affected the amendment getting passed in Indiana? No, um, the only thing I've seen, um, one of the problems is some of the records are sketchy for what happened and so you have to follow the newspapers. But the only thing I saw that happened with the flu pandemic is that there was a scheduled meeting in 1918 in Indianapolis and it was canceled because they, we're basically doing what we are doing, which is staying at home. And the women, a lot of the women didn't realize it until they were already on the trains oh. on the way to Indianapolis. Uh, and so they arrived in town to find out that they weren't even supposed to be there that day. Uh, so they did a quick meeting. Um, yeah, oops. Well, it was really hard to get, you know, they, they're, I guess they couldn't get them on the telephone. Most of the suffragists have telephone, but they were already on the train when it happened. Uh, but other than that, they don't say a whole lot, but you, ha you know it had to affect them. There's a really good article on Twitter that I just saw from uh, Elaine Weiss about national level. Mm -hmm. um, Macy wanted to know how present was the National Association of Colored Women in Indiana or Indianapolis? Many of, and, and by the way, I'm, I, a lot of what I've done is Indianapolis just because that's accessible and we have the information. Uh, the National Association of Colored Women, the same women who were suffragists also, uh, you'll find mentioned belonging to that group as well and going to their conventions uh, and things like that as well. At one point there was a large convention uh, in Indianapolis and I think it was the, the, the National Association of Colored Women and they invited um, some of the white suffragists, Grace Drew and Clark, Laura Don and uh, Amelia Keller, to attend their meeting while they uh, while it was in Indianapolis. Hmm. Um, let's shout out as you've been doing all this research. Uh, you spent a lot of time with these ladies. Uh, you got a favorite or a favorite story you want to share? <laughs> I know you I have to. All. I love them all. Um, <laughs> um, I, I sent you a picture of one that I think doesn't get enough credit. Uh, for what she does, uh, one of the unsung heroes, and anybody who's ever been the secretary of an organization will understand. There she is, right down there in the corner. Um, that's um, Julia Henderson, and starting in 1912, she was the secretary of the Women's Franchise League, which became the large suffrage organization that really pushed suffrage over the, over the line. Uh, and she served as their secretary from 1912 to 1917. Uh, and anybody who's ever been in an organization knows you want to have a secretary that stays a long time. They have the organizational memory. They know everybody around the state. Uh, and uh, she is really responsible for sending out all the pamphlets, all the materials, organizing the meetings, uh, finding the spaces. You know, that person that the group just can't do without. Uh, when she finally retired from that job in 1917, uh, she immediately stepped into being the deputy food administrator for Marion County uh, during World War I, and she created the 14-Minute Women, mm -hmm. uh, who were women who traveled the state giving 14-minute speeches about food conservation, uh, whatever the topic was for that day that the, the government wanted to get out about the war. 
And she was able to do that because she already knew everybody around the state uh, from her suffrage work. Um, so there were the big names, but I, I like sometimes the people who just keep the engine running. I was going to say, I think that it, what's amazing is I tr started making a list of the number of women that are listed in Anita's book. Um, and <laughs> there are over 90 some women that I have in a spreadsheet just to try to like get some background in at least some of them. Um, and some and some of them are so impactful for getting suffrage passed, but there's so little around on them. If you're to pick like your top three shout out, like someone's looking for a pandemic research project, who <laughs> would you suggest they look for? Um, there are an amazing number of Jewish women in leadership positions in the Indiana Woman Suffrage Associations, who also have leadership positions in the Council of Jewish Women. Uh, around the state, uh, and that needs to be investigated more uh, clearly because we often think, as you mentioned earlier, about suffragists as being these kind of white middle class professional, usually Protestant women. Uh, and uh, there were a lot of, of, I've talked to Rabbi Sasso about that, and there are a lot of archives we could look at and find out more about those women. So that desperately needs to be done. Shout out um, to Laura Messing Stern, right? She was like the Laura Messing oh, Stern. Sarah Messing Stern. Sarah, Sarah Messing Stern. There we go. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sarah Messing Stern. Yeah, I love her. I want to know her. I, I'm sorry I can't. Uh, she she just looked like a bundle of energy and a lot of fun. And I love reading her letters. So we do have her letters. Uh, I'd also, somebody needs to look more carefully at the politicians who supported suffrage, the men. I mean, really, in 1881, to vote in favor of suffrage, it was easy. Uh, it took a special session, but it was, it was an easy vote. In 1917, it was an easy vote. And then in 1920, when they ratified the 19th Amendment, there were only three dissents. And in Tennessee, remember, it was really close, and it was yeah. one vote. Uh, so what was it that... Why, why was that? Why were those votes unexpectedly easy? I can't imagine it was strictly because they suddenly found their heart and were in favor of suffrage. Was suffrage a political football? You know, what was going on? Yeah. Uh, that really needs to be looked at. Yeah. Um, um, Mary Beth was interested to know about how you can find information on religious breakdown of suffragists, especially um, in, she was interested in Catholic women and how they might have supported the topic. Any ideas? It's really hard to, to find out. Um, by the way, Dr. Graham, Dr. Hannah Graham, who led the Equal Suffrage Association, was Catholic. Uh, her, we actually have her will, and she left a lot of money to the Catholic Church. Uh, she was single and left a lot of money to that. But a lot of that is just a matter of they don't, they don't mention their religious background in their documents. So ancestry is just wonderful. Uh, or if you can find a will or something like that, because they don't. I see Lindsay said something about church newsletters. That's an option too. And one of the things that myself and Kisha Tandy have been trying to do is get in touch, for example, with the historic African-American churches in Indianapolis, because a lot of the suffrage groups would meet in the churches and trying to find information. And then of course we all had to shut down. So, um, I will say a lot of the diocese, I know that at least the Catholic diocese in Indianapolis, but I'm sure around the state have archives for their churches or their, um, pre, I, it's not called a precinct, but I'm calling it that, a diocese. Uh, so Parish. Parish, thank parish. you. Sorry. Um, <laughs> <laughs> not my fourth stuff. Looking at That's that may be a way to find out. I think it's a lot of this is this cross-reference thing. Um, and what I was finding is I try to dig into some of the ladies. The first thing is the hardest part is finding their first names because they all go by their husband's names. And then a lot it's of- so them, irritating. It's so <laughs> irritating. And you don't know what to search to find them, but then a lot of them did kind of disappear. So they're really active in like the twenties. And then you can maybe find an obituary for them in the- 50s so it's this whole side of it. it's kind of it's, a hard side of it um someone just asked about um purdue women um boiler up but also let's talk about college women like <laughs> where, 
how active were they? I seem to see a lot of the women who were super active in Indiana were college educated. We were college graduates. It's amazing how many women uh, in Indiana had attended Vassar mm -hmm. uh, and then lived in Indianapolis. 19 of them signed a letter to the newspaper once, uh, 19 uh, Vassar graduates. Uh, there were college chapters. DePaul had a suffrage chapter. Um, suffrage was discussed at IU. Uh, at Purdue, it must have been because Helen Gauger's up there. Uh, and that's just the way it goes. When Helen is around, you're going to discuss suffrage. Um, I have not heard anything really too much other than Gauger. Yeah, Helen Gauger dominates that whole Lafayette scene. Can you give uh, us a 30 or a 30 second or less summary of Helen Gauger? Because I don't know if I can. <laughs> really hard. Uh, married to a lawyer, uh, wanted to be a lawyer herself, studied with her husband, became a lawyer. She had a newspaper column. She was also a prohibitionist. She was also very outspoken. She did not like May Wright Sewell. May Wright Sewell did not like her. Um, there was a little conflict there. Um, she uh, tried to vote in 1894, uh, prearranged, was denied the vote. Um, um, uh, she sued, it went all the way to the state Supreme Court and the state Supreme Court said, no, you cannot uh, vote. Um, but she was, uh, she, she spoke for the Populist Party, she spoke for the Prohibitionist Party, she toured the state, she toured the nation. Um, She's a really interesting woman, and there is one biography out there about her, but since we now have access to so many more records, uh, and she spoke everywhere, it would be really good, I think, for somebody to take another look at her. There's a, there's a really good book there. I will say, uh, one, I'll just say so passing, as I wrap this up and toss it back to Bethany, I think she's someone that if you're looking, she never would compromise on the things she cared about. And that puts her at odds with how women were supposed to act in you know, this time period. So there's actually been some cool, interesting work done on her rhetoric um, and tracing her speeches, but fascinating people loved or hated her. And there's some fun letters kind of like, oh yeah, Aaron heard of pieces. Um, yeah. I hate to, to stop this because I'm having a whole bunch of fun, but I want to make sure y'all get from your happy hour to your dinner and maybe some more happy houring along the way. But thank you so much, Anita, for coming and talking to us. I hope everybody picks up this book from the Basile History Market. Um, and I guess back over to Bethany. <laughs> of course, I am putting that link in the chat again for the book. In case you don't have your copy, I highly recommend it. It is such a good read. Um, Linda Mim just started a history club at her school this year to look at, uh, for middle schoolers, to look all about local history and the women behind our local history. So it's a great addition, no matter what level of education you're looking at. Thank you so much, Callie, and thank you, Anita, for having this conversation with us. I know I don't want it to end, you guys don't want it to end, but Callie's right. We will wrap up so that you can all get on your way for this evening. If you enjoyed this program, I hope you will consider coming back for more. I said at the beginning of the program, next Thursday, we're going to be having our happy hour looking at distilling the history of Indiana's Black Forest with distiller and historian Alan Bishop of Spirits of French Lick. You can check out all of our upcoming offerings at indianahistory.org to stay up to date on all of the great virtual programs that will be coming your way. It's in the chat, but if you would like a copy of Anita's book, We Must Be Fearless, The Women's Suffrage Movement in Indiana, please check out the Indiana Historical Society Press link. You can also find that on our website. We are commemorating women's suffrage all year long, and so please keep up to date on all things suffrage at indianasuffrage100.org. If you missed your chance to donate or would like to make a further gift to help support the Indiana Historical Society and all of the programs that we do, please visit indianahistory.org slash donate. Your donation will help us to continue to share Hoosier stories. You're gonna get an email from us tomorrow morning with all of these links, so don't worry if you don't grab them today, and you'll see a short survey. When I say short, I am serious. It's like one minute or less. We would love to know what you thought about this program and get your thoughts on any upcoming virtual programs. We're gonna hopefully post this conversation to the Indiana Historical Society YouTube channel within the next week or two. So keep an eye out 
for that and all other history throughout Indiana history. Sorry, I trailed off there at the end. Thank you all so much for joining us. <laughs> we had a great time. Um, I look forward to seeing you all at a future program. Have a wonderful evening. Bye, everybody.